The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. And we are at the interview part of the show. Uh, today we are talking with true crime writer uh, for Wild Blue Press. Uh, called, the book is called Satin Pumps, The Moonlit Murder That Mesmerized the Nation. And the author is Steve Kosareff. Thank you for being here, Steve. Thank you. My pleasure. So, Steve, um, before we get into the story, let's, uh, this is the first time you've been on the show. How did you... Um, become a writer like where did that come from is, is this your first book no this is actually my second book my first book uh was called wendu to the future now that may sound like a new age kind of thing but it's not the publisher gave it that title chronicle books and it's actually about the marketing and selling of uh television sets during the golden age of the 1950s and 60s and it developed out of an interest that I had to actually create a, a television set museum, which unfortunately didn't happen, but uh, I had all this research, and uh, so I wrote this book and uh, submitted it to Chronicle Cold, and uh, an editor caught an editor's eye, and we went from there. Well, that's interesting, because now you, you talk about that with the TVs and selling it, and this, this story you've written in set and uh, pumps, it's, it's really something from what, the, the, the 60s or the late 50s, I believe. So, uh, Actually, uh, the, the murder took place in 1959. Right. So what, what something draws you to that time period or something, or are you just fascinated with that time period? Well, you know, I think like most people, uh, the time that they grew up in uh, sort of holds, uh, you know, either a fondness or possibly not so fond times. And our memories, and uh, that it, it wasn't so much the period, but it was what happened uh, that uh, I wrote the book about. That's why I was drawn to it. When, so when you go back to this this period, I have to say, so when you're when you're talking about a murder that happened in '59, um, what's it like going that far back, trying to find the information, or trying to find people that were alive or still alive now? that would talk about it? Well, most of them are deceased. Uh, actually, a couple of the principals, Carol Tragoff is in her early 80s, as does her ex-husband, Jimmy Papa. Uh, I really didn't want to interview anybody for this because I didn't want to have, you know, any preconceived notions as to what was going on. And most of the other people uh, who are still alive were very peripheral to the story. So I wrote the book based on my memories as a child uh, and also did a lot of research as an adult. And uh, I went through four newspaper archives, uh, books that were written about uh, the, the crime, though there weren't really that many. There would be sections about it in uh, books by uh, authors like Dorothy Kilgallen and um, who's the big uh, British crime novelist. I can't think of his name right now. It'll come to me later anyways. So I went through all of those. I actually got access, and it was some doing to the trial transcripts. Um, I originally believed that they were held by the Los Angeles Superior Court, and it turns out the district attorney's office had a set of them buried in a uh, off-site storage area, probably somewhere in the San Fernando Valley. And it took some doing, and I finally had access to those. It was a limited basis, not as much as I would have liked, but I was able to confirm uh, newspaper accounts where they were quoting the trial transcript, and, the, and based on uh, the newspapers, it was pretty accurate because I was able to check it against what the actual trial transcript said. What made you pick this story? Like, this isn't a well-known um, murder case in general. Well, you know, it, it was at the time. It actually was the O.J. Simpson trial of its time, uh, not only in Los Angeles, but nationally and internationally. Uh, it made newspaper headlines around the world, uh, on TV and radio. And then, you know, over the years, it's been 60 years, so it sort of died out. But it was a major case, and I have a personal connection to it. Uh, Dr. Finch was our family doctor. He delivered me as baby. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that is. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he was our family doctor for about eight years uh, until uh, close to, to the murder. And uh, so I remember him as a child, and I remember Carol Tregoff as a child. Uh, she was his medical assistant at the time, and I remember when I would go to, you know, for office visits. And as I later found out through research, she had a great memory, and she was very good at her job. Hmm. Did you like them? Like, so you really liked the doctor and, and Carol Tregoff? You know, from... From an eight-year-old perspective, you know, I didn't know a, a whole lot uh, at that time, and so I would say yes. Uh, it would have been, my mother is the one, uh, she's uh, no longer alive, but she's the one who would have been, uh, you know, the one that, as an adult would have been paying attention possibly. And it's funny, years later, we were having a discussion about Dr. Finch, and she goes, you know, when I saw him with Carol Tragoff, at the medical clinic. She goes, I knew something was going on. I saw the way they looked at each other. <laughs> and, you know, in, in hindsight, yeah, probably, but, you know, what if the murder hadn't happened? Would that have still registered? Hmm. What made this case become so popular? Uh, because it, these weren't like famous people. No, they weren't. Uh, Dr. Finch was a wealthy doctor in the San Gabriel Valley. His family history, uh, he had family ties to the eastern San Gabriel Valley that went back at least 50 years. His grandfather uh, was a former Confederate soldier who uh, abandoned post because he didn't believe in slavery and uh, you know, picked up his family and moved and died shortly thereafter, and then his wife, whose name was America, she brought her seven kids uh, to California to join her older son, who was actually uh, uh, Finch's grandfather. And eventually the family settled in the eastern San Gabriel Valley in Covina, and Finch's grandfather was one of the founding fathers of the city of Covina. And uh, Finch's father ended up uh, going to, uh, became an automatrist, uh, was a co-owner of a jewelry store with his brother, and the Finch name was pretty well known. And uh, Finch was kind of the golden boy. He got whatever he wanted. He stayed locally. He was very close to his parents. He went to a local college and a medical school in the area. And he just was at the right place at the right time. Uh, he partnered with his brother-in-law, Franklin Gordon, and uh, they developed the West Covina Medical Clinic, which was just right off uh, Garvey Avenue, which became the footprint for the San Bernardino Freeway. And here we are in the early 1950s in post-war America, you know, the suburbs are exploding and the eastern San Gabriel Valley was no different. It was just uh, probably like shooting fish in a barrel for them. Uh, they had uh, patients galore because of people moving into the area and then they started these properties. They also owned the West Covina Labs. So he was, they, they, his wife guessed that at the time uh, of her death that he was worth probably around in today's dollars, which would be about $6 million at that point. Uh, Carol Tragoff uh, was a young woman uh, in an unhappy marriage, uh, decided to seek a job, and she got hired as a receptionist at uh, the West Covina Medical Clinic and eventually became Finch's medical assistant. And what, the reason that this they became so popular uh, is, well, obviously because Finch was handsome, he was wealthy and charming, and Carol Tragoff was so photogenic, she could have been a movie star. And the, the reporters, the press, couldn't get enough photos of her. They couldn't, they couldn't report enough about her uh, comings and goings. It was like she was one of the Kardashians of the time. And, uh, and her mother was quite, a, her stepmother was quite a character, too. Uh, she was very close to her stepdaughter, and uh, they loved interviewing her as well. And uh, when Carol was out on bail, they would, the reporters would camp out on their doorstep hoping to get, you know, some quotable material. They would take photos of Carol playing the piano in her home. Um, it, was, it was quite a wild media ride. It's a real Perry Mason case, eh? <laughs> well, you know, there's an interesting connection that you mentioned Perry Mason now. Uh, the Finches belonged to the Los Angeles Tennis Club, and the president of the tennis club 
was Cornwell Jackson. Cornwell Jackson was Earl Stanley Gardner's uh, literary agent. And, of course, you know that Earl Stanley Gardner created the Perry Mason, or wrote the Perry Mason books. And uh, in, you know, probably the uh, early to mid-50s, uh, Cornwell Jackson's wife, Gil Patrick, who was a former actress from the 30s and 40s, was looking to make a change in her careers. And uh, because of their relationship with uh, with Earl Stanley Gardner, they formed a company called Paisano Productions with the hope of producing a, a a television series with Perry Mason. Uh, Earl Stanley Gardner was not happy with the iterations of the character in movies and so on before, and so he held off selling any more film rights for many years. But he liked uh, Gail's uh, take on the character, and they created this company, and that's when she went shopping looking for actors and a network to sell it to. But uh, Cornwell was president of the Los Angeles Tennis Club, where the Finches were members. And so uh, Gail and Cornwell knew the Finches through the tennis club, which they attended. And we're at the hearing, uh, you know, not only because they knew the Finches, but she's looking for material for the series. And she would later attend the first uh, trial at least once. Uh, there's a, a reporting of her being there. And eventually they did produce a series or an episode of Perry Mason that had a very small connection to the case where a character tried to kill uh, their wife by sending her in a car over an embankment, which is what Finch's and Carol's original plan was to do, to kill Finch's wife, Barbara. And not just get a divorce. Well, at the time, there were no community property laws in California. And if a spouse could prove adultery, they could end up with everything, uh, potentially. And Finch was afraid uh, be, that Barbara was going to do that. And uh, she actually had uh, hired a private investigator, and she had recordings of Finch and Carol and their loveness. They had run in an apartment together, even though he was still living with Barbara, uh, technically. And so Finch was afraid that, uh, you know, she might end up with everything, and so um, they were looking for a way to get rid of her. And their official story was that, uh, you know, the night that she was murdered, that they had come, driven from Las Vegas, where Carol was living at that point, to West Covina to talk to Barbara about a divorce, but uh, obviously that isn't what happened. And... Uh, so they were looking at a couple. Their initial plan was to hire somebody to uh, murder Barbara. Uh, and they weren't really very smart street criminals. Uh, Carol ended up hiring a con man by the name of Jack Cody that she had found through a couple friends of hers. And Jack Cody, uh, you know, he was more than willing to take the money, but he had no interest in murder. He had been arrested. He was actually on the lam from uh, Minnesota police when he was in Las Vegas. And so, you know, he promised to, to do it, and they agreed upon a very s small sum of less than $2,000. And he basically, they put him on a plane drunk to, to do the murder, and he actually stiffed them. <laughs> Finch found out the fall it was was supposed to be done on the 4th of July weekend in 1959, and Finch found out by calling his home that his wife was still alive when she answered the phone. So uh, they wanted to know what had happened, and Jack Cody says, well, I, I shot a woman. Uh, and uh, Finch says, well, that must have been her friend that she was staying with. And, he, and uh, so... Jack Cody said, well, I'll go back and do it right. And basically he pulled the same stunt again and stiffed him. And now they were forced to basically handle this on their own. They did have a plan B. And what their plan B was, they were going to neutralize Barbara when she came home uh, in her car, place the body in the car. They were going to, he was going to shoot her up with second all, and then an air bubble to kill her, they placed the body in his 1957 Chrysler 300C, which was a beautiful red convertible, and send that car over the embankment next to her home, hoping that it would look like an accident, that there wouldn't be any evidence that she had been murdered. And uh, their plan, that was their plan when they, they 
drove to West Covina from Las Vegas, he actually had a medical bag filled with these items, which would prove pretty damning during the trials that followed. And when they went to the house, Barbara wasn't there, so they waited in the dark on the front lawn for her to come back. When she drove into the garage, Finch snuck up behind her as she was starting to get out of the car, and all of a sudden things changed. For whatever reason, he hit her with the, the, the butt of his gun that he had, and the struggle ensued. She was knocked out once, but she came to, and there was a struggle, and she screamed out, and the Swedish au pair who was taking kids, care of their kids and was in her uh, bathroom getting ready for bed heard her scream and ran out into the garage. Now Finch had to deal with two women. While B- Barb was momentarily un- dazed and knocked out on lying on the garage floor, when the, the nanny, whose name was Marie Ann, ran into the garage, he, uh, she flipped on the lights and Finch lunged at her, not turned the lights off, and then started knocking her head into the wall. He hit her head into the wall so hard that there was actually an indentation of plaster that uh, photographers later got photos of. And uh, he pulled his uh, gun on her, fired into the garage to scare her, to scare her, and then ordered her into the back seat of the car. And now his plan was to kill both of them, sending the car over the bank bed. Uh, Barbara came to, he dragged her and set her in. Uh, the front passenger seat, and he went around to the driver's seat, and he's looking for the keys to the car to drive it over to the embankment to push it off. And he takes her purse, he dumps all her uh, contents out on the garage floor. Then it dawns on him, he hears the, the, the headlights of the car were still on, and the radio was playing, even though the motor wasn't running. So the keys are in the car, and as he dawns on him that the keys are in the car, Barbara jumps out and starts running down the driveway, and which was pretty amazing because she'd been hit at least twice, had two concussions, bleeding. And as she does that, Finch grabs a gun, comes around the other side, and follows her down the driveway. At that point, Marie Ann jumps out of the back seat of the car and runs into the house to call the police. Finch chases Barbara down the driveway, and his uh, parents lived in a house that was just on the other side of the private drive, down uh, about seven steps from the driveway. And as Barbara is running towards you, she's already broken one high heel, and she starts to run down the the seven dirt steps into her in-law's yard. And as she's doing that, Finch shoots her in the back. She collapses in the her in-laws yard and dies wow there you go that's pretty messy yeah it's pretty messy pretty exciting uh you know once you get all the details and everything which i write about in the book so none of the neighbors re- realized this was going on or it was too big of a place that they didn't see it or yeah there were anything like that uh you know he lived the house that he built which was modeled on the medical clinic uh was on three or four lots and the closest neighbor would have been his parents, and his parents went to bed relatively early. Later on, his father told police that he heard uh, what he thought were two cars backfiring, uh, or, or one car backfiring twice. He heard the gunshots but misinterpreted them. And I also think that his father was afraid that if he actually allowed himself to believe what in the back of his mind he probably knew, that it would be real. And... Uh, he loved his daughter-in-law, and he knew that they, you know, the Finches were had a very combustible relationship towards the end. Finch had strayed uh, during their marriage. In fact, his marriage to Barbara began as an affair. He had been married before, and so she was very aware of his history. And uh, even when he was having an affair with Carol, he was still seeing other women at the medical clinic. Uh, that medical clinic was like his dating pool. And <laughs> yeah, and and the women couldn't get enough of him. Uh, they were just lining up, you know, and fighting over themselves to to you know be Doctor Finch's next conquest. And um, when Carol joined his medical team as a medical assistant, Finch was having an affair with his nurse. So uh, he had a, a long history, uh, at least at West Covina Medical Clinic. And I would imagine this didn't start out of you know nowhere. That this had been going on in the other hospitals and medical clinics that he worked at. Uh, he 
you know, he you talk about your white male privilege, and Finch was, you know, he was a poster boy for it. Uh, he would drink Chrysler, and this 300C, I don't know if you're familiar with the car, was the fastest production model off out of Detroit at the time. The car could do 130 miles an hour. And uh, he would be driving, you know, down that San Bernardino freeway or wherever, in his medical smock and get pulled over. And, you know, they could smell liquor on his breath, but because of uh, the Finch name and him being a doctor and, you know, white male, he was let go. And he didn't, you know, he basically could do whatever he wanted and get away with it. And so, uh, you know, drinking and driving and these affairs, uh, you know, uh, were just all part of, the, part of his story. Well, and they were different times back then, too. That that stuff happened all the time. It, it did know. to an extent, but I don't know <laughs> to the extent where, you know, uh, uh, most affairs didn't end in murder. And uh, he was actually, yeah. he was even, I question his becoming a doctor uh, in the book. And because he was involved directly or indirectly with 11 uh, malpractice suits. And I even bear the scars of uh, his botched, uh, uh, you know, medical practice. Uh, at uh, two years old, he told my parents that to cure the breathing problems I had, I, like bronchitis and so on, that he should remove my tonsils. And so my parents were young and unsophisticated, so, you know, they thought, sure. So at two years old, I had my tonsils removed, but he did not remove all of them. He left the roots of my tonsils, which I still have to this day. And uh, so that's my little story. But he was involved. There were actually a couple children who died uh, directly related to his medical malpractice that I uh, talk about in the book. Maybe he was more interested in his image and, and the girls and the money and the and, the, and that sort of thing. Yeah, and uh, so I think the you know the becoming a doctor was sort of the road to enrich himself. Uh, his father had been an optometrist, but I think in their book, you know, an optometrist wasn't a real doctor, and they had the Finches had plans for Bernie uh, becoming a medical doctor or an attorney, something that would really have some real cachet to move the family up. Uh, beyond where it was, and not that they weren't wealthy enough at that point or, ha or well-known, but this would uh, move them further up a notch of the social ladder. Are you prepared? Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. Go now to LegacyFoodStorage.com. Use coupon code HOM15 now for 15% off. Quick, go. You're listening to the House of Mystery radio show. Well, you know, she wasn't quite the angel. She was actually, I, she was a major motivator for that happening. And I think she will be, wanted to become the third Mrs. Finch. And uh, she was married to this guy named Jimmy Papa. He was a culture model, uh, thought very highly of himself. Uh, if you've ever seen the Disney film Beauty and the Beast, one of them, and Gaston, that was kind of her husband. Uh, you know, there was nobody prettier in the world than Jimmy Papa, as far as he was concerned. And uh, yet his wife was very beautiful, and uh, he was sort of wrapped up in himself. And she, when she met Dr. Finch, it was a whole other thing. She always had an interest in older men, uh, even when she first met Jimmy. Uh, and after their marriage, she was still seeing older men, probably twice her age. And I don't know if she had daddy issues, but uh, she did like older men. And I think she liked them because... They were smarter, they had some mileage on them, and they generally had some money in their hands. And so Dr. Finch sort of fit that bill, and, you know, he's making overtures to her. And uh, they didn't just hit their their sexual relationship right off the bat. Uh, they, you know, had a couple meals together and so on. And finally, what she considers their first date, 
they went and had drinks at the Luau in Beverly Hills. And if you're familiar with that restaurant, it was owned by Stephen Crane, who was Lana Turner's husband. And it was one of those Polynesian-themed restaurants, which was, you know, the rage at the time. And Finch loved them. And so they were drinking scorpions for two, and those drinks are pretty much killer. And uh, I imagine that they were there till the, the restaurant closed and either left or were asked to leave. They got into his uh, Chrysler convertible, and they drove up into Hollywood Hills there, parked, and were admiring the, uh, the, the view down below. And eventually, Finch drives her home, and Jimmy, her husband, is waiting for her at 4.30 in the morning when she finally rolls into their home in La Puente. And, uh, of course, he wants to know where she's been all this time, and she's not forthcoming. She doesn't give him too much. So Jimmy thinks he's going to teach her a lesson, so he calls Finch's home, little, you know, not knowing that's who she was with, and said, Carol is not coming into work this morning. She's been out all night. And my guess is that Finch just started cracking up and had a muffle of laughter and said something like, oh, I know something about that. Uh, she can take the day off and probably just was cackling like a, you know, crazy uh, actually, I describe what I believe was a scene when that happened in the book. And um, so at, at that point, uh, Jimmy was starting to get a little physical abusive. And, you know, you can't blame him because his wife is cheating on him. She won't tell him where she's been. And he's already heard some suspicions. Barbara Finch called him earlier, and he actually went over to her house and she figured that Jimmy was the key to breaking up uh, Finch and Carol's relationship. And uh, he told her, you know, he'd heard stories that they had been seen in Palm Springs together. But, you know, he thought it was just gossip. You know, they worked together, so they could have been seeing a patient. And Barbara's telling him, no, that she didn't believe that was the case. And then Jimmy says, well, why don't you get a divorce? And she says, I've been married before. She says, I don't want a divorce. And she enjoyed being Mrs. Finch. It gave her, she had social cachet. Uh, she was a member of the Los Angeles Tennis Club. She was friends with uh, singer uh, or dancer, actors of Vera Allen, uh, actor, director Mark Stevens, who did a lot of film noirs. Uh, she played tennis pretty well. And then when she wanted to slum, she could go down and, to the South Hills Country Club, which was right on the other side of their road from their house, and, you know, slum with the local doctors and attorneys in the area. So she was very happy, uh, and I go into her background as to why this mattered so much in the book. Uh, she had been, at one time, her family had some money. They lived in Beverly Hills, but then the Depression hit, and her father lost uh, the shoe store in Be custom shoe store in Beverly Hills that he owned, and it was sort of a downhill slide from there where she ended up in the Antelope Valley with her mother. Her parents were now divorced. Her father was drinking. And she wasn't in very good social straits at, at that point and, or financially. And when she got married to her first husband, he was an automotive mechanic. And she didn't see herself living in Baldwin Park, which was not very – you wouldn't call that a Tony area at all. She didn't want to stay in Baldwin Park, and she didn't want to stay married to him. And and when she met Dr. Finch initially, uh, it was she'd gone to him for uh, some medical help, and he treated her, and actually delivered her first child from her first husband. And then she ended up working for him, and she sort of uh, followed or set up the Carol Tragoff course where. They both ended up working for Finch, and then the affairs began from that. So she was pretty conversant into knowing what was happening with Carol. And once she saw Carol, she was scared. She sort of looked the other way with the other women that Finch was having affairs with because she knew they wouldn't last. But once she met Carol, I think she realized that there was something different there. And uh, so that sort of set the whole ball rolling as, as far as, uh, the tri the love triangle. Well, I think they had when uh, the after uh, Finch murdered Barbara, 
uh, and fled. He ended up stealing a couple cars, and it's quite a story as to him doing that and driving to Las Vegas back to Carol's apartment where he met up with her. Uh, Carol went to work. She worked at the Sands Hotel as a cocktail waitress. And the the sheriffs had heard about Finch. They were looking for him, and they knew that she worked at the Sands Hotel. So one of the sheriff's detectives went to the Sands and asked Carol, and she gave up Finch. She said, yeah, he's at my place sleeping. They went over there, and they arrested him and held him until the West Covina police could fly into Las Vegas and pick him up. So she gave a statement willingly, and uh, they didn't suspect her being directly involved in this. And uh, she agreed to go back to West Covina to, uh, you know, to testify at a hearing. And she did drive back to West Covina. And uh, just prior to the hearing, she and Finch, they allowed her to have a private conversation with Finch in a patrol car. And I believe that Finch promised her that he would, no matter what happened, he would not involve her or tell, you know, or testify that she had been involved in the murder. The reporters noticed when she left the car, she was smiling. And so, you know, she's pretty sure when she's on the witness stand that she's basically just going to be a witness. At the same time, the DA is starting to put things together. And just uh, when the judge is about to release her off the stand, the witness stand, the, the judge asked the DA, well, I imagine now that uh, she can be released as a witness, and the DA surprises everybody in a courtroom with a Perry Mason moment and says, no, Your Honor, we're going to arrest her as soon as she steps off the witness stand, which is what they did. And, you know, the people jump up, the judge has to call order. I mean, it was really a melodramatic moment that actually happened in real life. And they hauled her out to a holding cell. Uh, in Covina, they actually took her to Covina City Jail because West Covina did not have holding facilities or booking facilities. They took her there, and they fingerprinted her, and they stuck her in a holding cell till it was time to haul her and finch her back to county jail. But everybody was up in arms, including her mother. And uh, yeah, she was surprised. Uh, on the witness stand, she had admitted to having sexual relations with Finch, and I actually think in the back of her mind she thought she was being arrested because she was telling about her history with Finch, not the fact that she had been involved in a conspiracy to murder Barbara. And, and if you have Dorothy Kilgallen reporting on it as well, um, that's that's quite the controversy. She was, uh, yeah, she had a major role in the in the first trial. Uh, she would fly back and forth uh, on the weekends because she was a panelist on What's My Line at the time, which was being broadcast live uh, in from New York. So she would take a red eye after the show and come back to be in the courtroom on Monday mornings uh, in Los Angeles. And the last major uh, criminal case she actually handled, a lot of people don't know that outside of her being panelist, she was actually a respected uh, journalist. Uh, she had... Two people knew her two ways as a journalist. One were her Broadway and Hollywood co- gossip columns, but she actually reported on uh, crimes too. I think she had been at the Lindbergh uh, baby uh, murder trial, and she had at the Sam yeah. Shepard uh, trial, which five years earlier. And she apparently wrote a really moving piece about Marilyn Shepard's body lying in repose uh, in death. And something that nobody else did. She had. She would try and find an angle or a take on it that no other reporter would have. So she uh, was at the first Finch trial. Uh, the first major day was January 5th, 1960, for this trial. And she brought her friends. She had brought Clifton Webb and Sonia Henney, the ice skater, and Cobina Wright, who was a socialite. And uh, she made a grand entrance into the courtroom with two copy boys on either side of her. And it was like a movie star arriving because she dressed very glamorous. The judge pinned an orchid on her. Uh, It was all quite (laughs) very Hollywood. And uh, she reported on the trials. And towards the end of the first trial, she actually had a mole on the jury who was feeding her information. 
and I've never been able to find out who it was exactly, but I think it was one of two men. Uh, the jury was composed unusual uh, for the time, even in Los Angeles, was a mixed racially. Uh, there was actually an African American man on it and a Latino man. And uh, there was a lot of uh, infighting and racism on that uh, jury. There was actually a woman who probably, uh, she didn't have a Klan membership. She was probably thinking of applying. And she locked horns and hit, you know, with these guys. And there were physical threats of violence. Uh, she claims that one of the guys picked up a chair and was going to break the window, several storms in the jury room and throw her out. And uh, other women ran for a buzzer to call a bailiff. And this was, uh, you know, during the time they were deliberating. And um, it actually led to a mistrial the first time. And fin I doubt that Finch or not, nor Carol actually knew that the reason that they there was a mistrial, it was due to racism. That Their lives were spared initially because of that. And... Uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, at, once the jury was finally, uh, when it was deadlocked and they were released, she was waiting out on the sidewalk of the courthouse, and she spotted the, the African-American man and the Latino man and called them over. And she had been tipped off about a taxi phone, which is hidden behind a bush on one of these buildings, and uh, she invited them for drinks. She, she ran over to where this taxi phone was hidden behind the bush, got on it, got a taxi, and they were whisked to her suite at the Ambassador Hotel. And she's talking to these guys, and one of them happens to have kept a journal and pulls it out of the, the, the trial proceedings. So now she's got some major fuel, and she wrote about, uh, you know, she, many columns about this trial, particularly having this inside information, uh, you know, uh, just as the first trial ended in a mistrial. Yeah, she had quite the life. Um, quite the life. Do you think she killed herself, or do you think she um, overdosed, or someone killed her? I, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories about that. I, I actually think that she overdosed, and it was probably accidentally because they found her body. She was fully dressed, reading, I believe, and I don't think that uh, uh, that she committed suicide. I think it was accidental, and she had been doing a lot, as you probably know, been doing a lot of drugs and drinking. At that point, she was in an unhappy marriage. Uh, she uh, was very fond of singer Johnny Ray, and you know he was mo most likely gay, and that wasn't going to go anywhere. And uh, so, uh, and she had a penchant for young men. She loved. There were a couple bailiffs at the Finch trial. She was just goo goo eyes over, and she rep talked about them in her columns. And in fact, she got one of them a screen test at one of the major studios. And uh, you know, when you see photos, these guys appear in some of the uh, press photos, and they were handsome. But she loved her; she loved younger men, that's for sure. So there's a couple of trials. How did it end up at the at the very end of it? Um, what happened to uh, Dr. Finch and his uh, girl Carol? Well, they actually went through three trials, and the the. Uh, prosecution and defense teams were thought it might even go into a fourth. If it had gone to a fourth, it would have set a record. Would have been the first court case in in uh, California that had gone through four trials. But by the time the third trial hit, a lot of the hoopla had died down. They were in a smaller courtroom, and everybody was focused. Uh, they wanted this. To, they wanted to get to a finish line. And so everybody was doing their jobs at this point. There wasn't a lot of nonsense going on. And finally, um, what the thing that tipped it off is all the juries had gone to the Finch home and walked the grounds to see, you know, get a sense of really what went on. And the third jury not only went once, they went twice. And after they went back the second time, they came back and they just, they thought, well, let's reenact the way that Finch actually claimed his wife died. He claimed it was an accident, that he threw the gun away and it discharged and hit her in the back. And no matter what they did is physically trying to get in the positions that he claimed he and his wife were in when she was shot, it just didn't make any sense, and they realized he was lying. Uh, they also, at this point, believed Jack Cody, who was the uh, con man that Finch and Carol 
initially hired to kill, uh, he was kind of an oily character, but the one thing he always did tell was the truth. And they, this jury finally believed him. So they convicted Finch of uh, first-degree murder. Carroll was convicted of conspiracy to murder, which carried just as much weight, uh, you know, penalty as uh, if she actually held the gun. The only reason she didn't get first-degree murder is because she never touched the gun. Uh, she did bring the medical kit, which contained all the things to kill Barbara Finch up, so that's how they got her in conspiracy. And at this point, there was a week between the time that they were convicted and the time they were sentenced, and they could have really been, uh, they could have been put in the gas chamber. And at the time, uh, just recently, uh, Carol Chessman, who had been convicted of rape, and had fought the, the death penalty for 12 years uh, in San Quentin, he was finally executed for rape. And here Finch and Carroll were convicted of murdering his wife. So it looked like they could well have received the gas, the, the gas chamber as their penalty. Uh, but they actually uh, dodged a bullet, so to speak, and they got life sentences. And... You know, Finch was happy with that because he wasn't going to be murdered, put to death. But Carol, being so young, the first thought that crossed her mind is, I'll be an old woman by the time I get out. And so she broke down uh, and got out of the, you know, out of the courtroom as quickly as she could, leaving Finch behind. And they did serve term, time. Uh, she served about eight years. I think she was released in 1969. She... Uh, assumed another name, but she stayed in the area, and she stayed in the field. She ended up working in the records division of Inner Community Hospital in Cabina. She worked there for several decades and then finally retired, and all her co-workers knew who, who she was. They wouldn't ask her or talk to her about the case, but when she was out on vacation, they'd all get together and gossip <laughs> about it. Yeah. And, uh, and as far as I know, she's still living in that area. Uh, Finch ended up, uh, he got a job in Missouri once he was finally released, I think it was 1971, and he had lost his medical license finally at this point, and he went to Missouri as an x-ray technician. There was a small town there that wanted him. He tried to get his medical license back while he was in Missouri and actually took, you know, the necessary exam and everything, and it still didn't happen. He finally came back to California and got his uh, medical, was reinstated, got his medical license back in 1984 and moved to Rancho Mirage near Palm Springs. And for the last 11 years of his life, he practiced medicine. Uh, he died of natural causes, and he's buried in the same cemetery that my parents are, along with Barbara, who I found out in an unmarked grave, and there's quite a story that goes with that. Oh, boy. I'll tell you, this is a case. Um so you like writing true crime? <laughs> uh, I had fun. You know, this is kind of a memoir. It's kind of a hybrid because uh, interweave my story in and out mostly in the beginning. You get some background. So, uh, you know, because both Finch and I were grew up in Covina. Uh, you know, obviously we're 30 years difference. But you can see I'm sort of in a lower middle class family, and he's in a wealthy, uh, socially prominent family. And you could see how sometimes things can go wrong with that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what's your plans next? You're going to do another true crime, or are you going to do something else, or are you going to quit writing? Um, right now I'm trying to sell this as a limited television series. I really think it would be a great 10 to 12 part uh, limited series for like HBO, Netflix, uh, FX. So I'm in the process of trying to, to uh, sell the film and TV rights and hopefully have an active part in writing it and producing it. Uh, I am working on another book, which is actually a memoir about my father's 20-year battle with Alzheimer's and the effect of that on our family. And uh, so I'm working on that. Uh, I don't have any other plans for a true crime book at this point, but who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, now do, do you have a website of your own or something that uh, people can come find out more about you? Yeah, they can go to stevekosareff.com. Uh, it might be difficult if you don't know how to spell my name. Uh, they might start by looking up Satin Pumps. Uh, if you go to facebook.com backslash Satin Pumps, 
or at Satin Pumps on Twitter. There will be links to uh, the publisher and to information on me on the website. And you'll get some more background. There's a lot of photos uh, that I have collected over the years on the case. Uh, there are photo Some of those photos are in the book. And uh, so you can trace me back through uh, Satin Pumps. Fantastic. We will have that up on our website as well, so people are listening in, or they can do one click, they can find you and find your website. So, um, wow, what a story. This is a, a great, great book and a great story, and um, thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Our guest has been Steve Kosaroff. The book is called Satin Pumps. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This is Peter of something with media.